In Algebra 2, we introduced you to the rational functions. The parent function of the rational functions was y equals 1 over x. And the graph of y equals 1 over x were two asymptotes that occurred, not asymptotes, sorry, two hyperbola that occurred in quadrants 1 and 3. And they had these things called asymptotes, which were lines that the graph gets closer and closer to, but never actually touches. The asymptotes of the parent function were the x-axis, which is the line y equals 0, and the y-axis, which is the line x equals 0. The x-axis was called a horizontal asymptote, and the y-axis was called a vertical asymptote. And there was a very simple way of finding vertical asymptotes. Vertical asymptotes were just solved by setting the denominator equal to 0 and then solving for x. We found out that there wasn't necessarily one vertical asymptote. You could have multiple vertical asymptotes. But you could only have one horizontal asymptote if it exists. There was another point of discontinuity that we talked about called a point discontinuity. But in Algebra 2, you probably called it a hole. And we're going to discuss how to find all three of these discontinuities. Let's start by talking about vertical asymptotes. Vertical asymptotes occur anywhere the denominator of the fraction equals 0 because we know we can't have 0 in the denominator of a fraction. So to find the vertical asymptote, you would just take the denominator and set it equal to 0, and then solve for x. And that would be the vertical asymptote. That means if you were to graph this, there would be an invisible line right there that the graph didn't cross. In the next one, uh, g of x, you can have more than one vertical asymptote. But when you set this denominator equal to 0, in order to solve, you have to use the zero product property. That was the one that said you set each of the parentheses equal to 0 and then solve. So it turns out that the two vertical asymptotes are at 2 and negative 1. Sometimes we have to do a little more work to get to the vertical asymptote. In h of x, when I set that quadratic equal to 0, the best way to go about solving it is to put it in factored form. Although there is a graphing calculator technique where you could put this in your graphing calculator, graph it, and find where the parabola hits the x-axis. You'll get the same solution that I'm about to get using factoring. So the two numbers that multiply to give you negative 6 but add to give you negative 1 are negative 3 and positive 2. And now we're going to set each of these equal to 0 using the zero product property in order to find the vertical asymptotes. And the vertical asymptotes are at 3 and negative 2. We're going to do these three problems again, but this time we're going to find something called a horizontal asymptote. Horizontal asymptote, it's not really an algebraic process like it was for finding the vertical asymptotes, but there are rules about what the horizontal asymptote of a rational function is. Remember I said you can't have more than one horizontal asymptote, so you're either going to have one horizontal asymptote or no horizontal asymptote. And the rules I'm about to give you are the same as the ones we give the calculus students, except we write, we, we give you different words. So here's the first thing that can happen. The first rule is if the largest exponent of x in the numerator and denominator are the same, then the horizontal asymptote is the ratio of the coefficients of x. So, you need the largest exponent of x in the numerator and denominator to be the same. In f of x, 
the largest exponent of x in the numerator and denominator is 1. They're the same. So the horizontal asymptote is the ratio of the coefficients of those x's. Remember, the coefficient is the number that comes in front of x. So the number in front of x in both cases happens to be 1. So it turns out that the horizontal asymptote is at y equals 1. That means if I were to graph this, there would be an imaginary line right there. I want you to look at g of x. The largest exponent of x in the numerator is 3. But the largest exponent of x in the denominator is 2. Wait a second, where, where did I get 2 from? If you were to FOIL this, the first term would be x squared. And then in the third one, h of x, the largest exponent of x in the numerator is 1, and the largest exponent of x in the denominator is 2. So they're not the same as well. The next definition is if the largest exponent of x is in the denominator, then the horizontal asymptote is y equals 0. That means it's the x-axis. I'll write that there. x-axis. So let's go back up here to the two that we didn't work with yet. We determined that h of x, the larger exponent of x, was in the denominator because the, x, the largest exponent of x in the numerator is 1 and the largest exponent of x in the denominator is 2. So in this case, the horizontal asymptote is y equals 0. The last definition, if the largest exponent of x is in the numerator, then the horizontal asymptote does not exist. That means if the bigger exponent of x is in the numerator, this rational function does not have a horizontal asymptote. So we can say none. In calculus, we say it does not exist. We talked about different types of discontinuities, and asymptotes are infinite discontinuities. Last year, we also introduced you to something called a hole, which was a point discontinuity. A hole or point discontinuity occurs when there is a common factor in the numerator and denominator of a function such that it would cancel, because we like to cancel common factors in the numerator and denominator. But you don't always know if there's a common factor unless you put everything in factored form. So the rule with this particular unit is that anything that can be factored, you should factor it. So in f of x, the numerator, x squared minus 1, is something we come across all the time. It's called the difference of two squares. It factors into x plus 1, x minus 1. And the denominator, x squared minus 2x plus 1, the two numbers that multiply to give you positive 1, but when you add them, give you negative 2, are negative 1 and negative 1. So I want you to notice there's a common factor in the numerator and denominator that cancel. If they cancel, if I have to put a slash through them, then that's going to be a hole and the whole is going to be at x equals 1. How do I know? Because I set that equal to 0 when I solve for x. Now I want you to notice there's still something in the denominator. There's an x minus 1, in which case there would be a vertical asymptote at 1. And so if you actually graph this, you'll see that it's actually a vertical asymptote. But this was a good problem to show you that if you have a common factor in the numerator and denominator, they end up canceling. So it really is a vertical asymptote when the vertical asymptote uh, kind of takes over the whole. Let's look at g of x. Let's factor the numerator. The two numbers that multiply together to give you 4, but when you add them, give you 4, are positive 2 and positive 2. Hey, look. I have an x plus 2 in the numerator and an x plus 2 in the denominator. They're going to go away. If they go away, then that results in a whole. And the whole will be at x equals negative 2. And there's nothing left in the denominator. If you were to graph this, you would get the equation y equals x plus 2. It's just that if you go to the table, you'll see that at x equals negative 2, the table says error.
there is another type of asymptote that we did not introduce to you last year, and it's called the slant asymptote. Sometimes there is a line, it's linear, that cuts through the graph such that the graph does not cross it. A slant asymptote only occurs when the exponent of x in the numerator is exactly one more than the exponent of x in the denominator. So let's look at f of x here. I want you to notice that the largest exponent of x in the numerator is 3, and the largest exponent of x in the denominator is 2. So the numerator is exactly one more than the denominator. How do we find the slant asymptote? Well, we're going to use polynomial division. When we learned how to do polynomial division in Algebra 2, one of the things you learned was that you need to account for missing terms. So you need to be careful. The denominator, x squared plus 1, has a missing term. And that missing term is 0x. Because whatever the largest exponent is, each consecutive term, its power of x must go down by 1. So I have x squared, but where's the term with x to the first? It wasn't there, so I make it 0. I make sure the numerator also doesn't have any missing terms. Luckily, it doesn't. It goes 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, so since the divisor has three terms, what we do is we look at how many times x squared plus 0, x plus 1 goes into the first three terms here, x cubed minus 2x squared plus x. It was actually really easy because all you have to do is determine what you need to multiply the first term by so that you get this. You don't have to worry about any of the rest of the terms. Well, if you have x squared and you want to make it an x cubed, you have to multiply it by x. So we're going to multiply by x, and I want you to look where I put the x. I put it above the third term. Now I'm going to multiply everything in the divisor by x. I get x cubed plus 0x squared plus 1x. And this is longhand division. We subtract. So x cubed minus x cubed is 0, so these cancel. They should always cancel. Negative 2x squared minus 0x squared is negative 2x squared. And then x minus x is 0x. Bring down the next term. We're going to do this one more time, and then we're actually done. We don't even have to complete the longhand polynomial division like we normally do. So now I want to multiply x squared by whatever I need to multiply it by so that it becomes a negative 2x squared. Well, it's just missing a negative 2. And I'm done with the problem. The slant asymptote is the linear equation y equals x minus 2. In other words, if I were to graph this, there would be a line here that the graph does not cross. The last thing we're going to talk about is transformations on the parent function, something we spent a lot of time talking about last year. So we said the parent function of the rational functions is y equals 1 over x. So if I give you y equals 2 over x minus 4, you should be able to tell me that this, uh, we say it uh, stretches or expands vertically by a factor of 2. And then down here, this moves the graph to the right, 4. If I were to give you y equals negative 3 over x plus 2 minus 1, we would reflect over x-axis. We would move to the left, 2. And then this out here would move it down, 1. Oh, and the 3 would stretch vertically by 3. So there are a lot of things happening. But what if I give you a problem that's not set up in that format? How are we going to determine its transformation? Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to rewrite it so that it is in that format. And the way we're going to rewrite y equals negative 4x plus 2 over x plus 5 is we're going to go back and do 
polynomial division. Again, I know you're so excited. So x plus 5 goes on the outside of the divisor. Negative 4x plus 2 goes on the inside. Remember that the way this works is you just want to know what are you going to multiply x by so that it becomes negative 4x. You're going to multiply it by negative 4, I hope. So now we're going to multiply the entire divisor by negative 4. We get negative 4x minus 20. But now we're actually going to subtract these. So negative 4x minus negative 4x is 0. Be very careful about your signs. 2 minus negative 20 is the same as 2 plus 20, which is 22. That, remember, that's your remainder. But there's another way of writing this. And the other way of writing it is it's negative 4 plus the remainder over the divisor. Wait a second. Now that does look like that format from earlier. I'm going to stretch vertically by a factor of 22. I'm going to move it to the left, 5. And I'm going to move it down, 4. And so if you don't know what the transformations are, you're going to have to use polynomial division to help you out. And that is graphs of rational functions.